All right, welcome. I'm Ryan Holger with TEC, and today I'm lucky enough to have with me Brian Monk from Carrier Corporation. Uh, Brian's going to be talking to us about a new carrier product specifically for hospital and healthcare usage uh, and talking about how to apply it and duct it and all that wonderful stuff. So I'm going to turn everything over to Brian. Thank you, Ryan. Uh, good morning, everyone, and uh, thanks for joining the call. My name is Brian Monk, and I'm the uh, National Sales Manager for Carrier's Custom Air Side uh, Division. Um, and with me uh, today also on the call is Debbie Kiley from our Vertical Sales uh, uh, Division for Healthcare, um, and she's the manager for those strategic accounts. Um, today is going to be a, a, a comprehensive uh, review. Uh, we've got about an hour. It shouldn't take that long, maybe about 45 minutes, to discuss not only Carrier's uh, new OptiClean uh, negative pressure air filtration system uh, that we've just launched to the market, but also just some of the latest things that are going on with the SARS-CoV-2 uh, or, or COVID-19 um, as a uh, as a virus and airborne infectious disease. Um, we do a lot of work in the uh, healthcare uh, markets in general, uh, as far as carriers concerned, particularly uh, on the air side. So I want to focus a little bit on some of the products that we have available and some of the expertise that we brought to um, infectious disease applications before isolation rooms, ICU, surgery suites, and so on. So it'll be a little bit more comprehensive, and then we're gonna finish off a little bit with uh, you know, more details about a, a negative air pressurization machine uh, or negative pressure um, machine. So you know, the first question on everybody's minds, and we're seeing this a lot, is uh, you know, where do we put uh, COVID patients that are either uh, suspected of, um, of having uh, the disease or, you know, or in the infection, uh, and maybe showing symptoms, or maybe not, um, but through blood tests have indicated that they have something. So that's become a, a big uh, concern at Carrier. We've had a lot of questions from our sales and distribution network. A lot of the consulting engineers that we work with have asked us, they're setting up temporary tents, they're setting up uh, you know, parking garages, hotels, or hotel rooms that are similar to patient rooms in certain sizes. And they're, they're looking at ways to adapt the existing HVAC system to either uh, integrate a negative uh, pressure system, create negative pressure in a particular room that didn't have it before, or uh, put in some kind of added filtration into some of our existing systems, right? So we have a lot of uh, infrastructure out there with existing HVAC air handlers, um, and they want to look at, uh, you know, what can we do to retrofit them? Can we add HEPA filtration? Can we add UV or ultraviolet germicidal irradiance, which we'll talk a little bit about uh, today. So all of that, all that comprehensive kind of review, um, it, it, it comes into play with regards to what ASHRAE is thinking about now. So some of you on the call might have been, you know, might be aware of some of the documents. I'm going to make reference to ASHRAE's uh, position document on airborne infectious disease, and that was reissued in um, uh, in February 5th. Uh, you know, here in the U.S. or well, let's say worldwide. Um, as a result of uh, what was ongoing or what was starting to happen in Southeast Asia as it was moving uh, across Europe and then into uh, the North American uh, uh, North American market, um, where we now see uh, the infection rates climbing, uh, you know, rapidly in, in some areas tapering off, but in some areas not. So uh, some of that guidance has been given, and um, we'll talk a little bit about what Ashray says. I took some key excerpts from some of the areas, and we'll make reference to it as we go through. Um, the you know just to sort of set the stage, Carrier has an, a what we call an immediate response flyer that was issued, and it identifies some of the equipment that we have available, not ne necessarily from a manufacturing standpoint, but also uh, air, air handling systems that are already in stock that can be deployed and maybe even modified quickly to adapt to some of uh, some of the needs that you might see. Um, so those documents are available. TEC, of course, has all of that information available. If you need to get a hold of them, you can, um, and it'll give you some guidance as to you know what can be deployed. There's also the Rental Systems Division of Carrier that does this on a regular basis, not necessarily for COVID, but for other types of facilities that need temporary cooling uh, and maybe even temporary filtration. So that's another avenue that we have made available to our customer base sort of say, look, if you need a rapid unit, something in the rental can be adapted to maybe meet your immediate needs uh, for patient overflow and things like that. So let's talk a little bit about SARS-CoV-2 uh, as it's formally labeled and COVID-19 as it's labeled as the, as the disease, um, the airborne infectious disease that you might, you might uh, you know, get. 
Um, we'll talk about ASHRAE 170, which some of you on the call I'm sure are very familiar with in terms of uh, healthcare guidelines. Um, something that we found interesting from the Minnesota Department of Health, uh, also with uh, some graphic representations of how a negative pressure system, HEPA system, can be employed uh, in a room. And then we'll talk a little bit about some of the existing equipment the carrier has available from either filtration or airside uh, standpoint. So um, meeting requirements, obviously, in healthcare applications is not only about filtration. It's also about temperature control. It's also about humidity control, uh, which we'll see in some of Ashray's latest documents. There's a, a document that was issued today, actually, that I'm going to make mention of. Um, so a lot of what I've talked, or what I will be talking about, is um, is prepared in concert with Ashray, as well as uh, American Society of Healthcare Engineers, ASHI. Um, <clears throat> so moving forward, uh, let's take a look at some of Ashray's latest guidelines from uh, Standard 170, right? So ASHRAE systems can protect healthcare workers and instill confidence uh, by creating a safe environment. And um, in particular, what ASHRAE is uh, looking at or our focus today on the negative pressure systems is on airborne infectious isolation or AII rooms, uh, which require about 12 air changes per hour. It all depends on, on the room and some of the guidelines and some of the local codes in healthcare. But in general, that's what we're trying to achieve. And the units can be applied in different ways, right? We can look at it as a negative pressure unit where we're exhausting out of that room to create a negative pressure area. So a patient who is um, who has COVID, highly infectious disease, doesn't necessarily uh, infect anybody in adjacent spaces um, in the other rooms around the hospital or in the main corridors. Uh, so that's a way of retrofitting an existing room. That patient room might not have been a negative pressure room to start off with, but it became one by virtue of us retrofitting uh, the space. And as you can appreciate, there's a lot of things that come with that, right? Uh, what happens to the existing HVAC system? What happens to the ventilation balancing? What happens to the controls? What happens to the chilled water temperature? Um, do we need to readjust certain things if we start creating these negative pressure rooms? So those are the kind of questions that we've been seeing as well come our way. And of course, every hospital is different and every application is different. So we need to sort of relook at it um, in a very uh, uh, concentrated way for you know case specific, if you will. So um, ASHRAE talks a little bit about not only the filtration part of it or air cleaning, but also talks about exhaust systems to remove the contaminants from the space. Of course, source capturing is always your best, right? Your best way to do it in a patient who has, uh, you know, um, any kind of aerosol uh, or uh, any kind of, um, of output of contaminant uh, as they cough or as they speak or as they breathe out of the, um, you know, air, aeration device or mask that they're, they're wearing um, could cause infection. So exhausting contaminants is always a good strategy. Filtration and removal of the contaminants is another one. And then creating negative spaces relative to others. So there are a variety of, you know, different types of strategies that have been out there. Some of our equipment, this is not carrier equipment, just to sort of set the stage as to, you know, what is a portable machine versus a pre-assembled machine. We're seeing a lot of ad hoc type um, uh, methodology in health, healthcare right now where they're tapering off rooms with, you know, plastic sheathing, you know, similar to what you would see in a uh, removal of asbestos, you know, a hazmat kind of uh, in, a, in a construction zone. It's the same idea in healthcare, right, for those that are not as familiar with it. They tape off the room with usually a clear plastic so you can kind of see into it and you create either negative zones or neutral pressure zones and, and maybe try and seal up a particular room where somebody is. And then there's the ad hoc assembly systems that have been put in place and even retrofit of existing rooftops. Right? We've been involved <clears throat> as of late in the last couple of weeks with regards to rooftop systems that have HEPA filtration or that wanted to add HEPA filtration to them. So ramping up the fan system, modifying the fan system, putting in HEPA filtration uh, to what degree of effectiveness, you know, is, is debatable depending on, you know, what the, uh, what, what the hospital's concern is. But generally speaking, we're looking at HEPA filtration at 99.97% effective at point mi uh, point 0.3 micron or larger. Um, and of course, you know, that will typically handle, uh, you know, coughs and sneezes and things like that. Uh, that are, you know, what we call suspended droplets, right, or water droplet nuclei. Uh, there's a lot of mechanics involved with charting and tracking what happens with a patient as they cough or sneeze or even just breathe or speak um, or speak loudly. And I'm sure some of you have seen some of those videos that have been out lately 
that uh, where scientists attract you know where those particles end up and whether they fall out of the airstream or whether they disperse or even stay resident in the airstream for an extended amount of time. Um, so there's some discussion around that. There's also discussion about the mean particle diameter of COVID-19 in particular, right, which is generally smaller than 0.3 micron. Uh, so there's a lot of discussion about that and wondering whether a HEPA filter at 99.97 at 0.3 micron and above is actually going to be adequate to remove uh, COVID. But, you know, ASHRAE has got some guidelines on that and we'll walk through some of those details. Just to compare, right, an N95 mask that everybody's talking about right now, which is 95% efficient against most airborne uh, particulate for the, for the wearer of the mask, right? The N95 has got a special uh, geometric configuration, so it fits well on your face. And it was, you know, it's used particularly for healthcare professionals, but a lot of people are obviously looking at getting them themselves. There's some merit, of course, as well to having the mask on and protecting others from whatever you cough out or, you know, if you are a patient. Um, so, or you've been tested positive for it. So uh, there's a lot of debate about whether masks should be worn all the time or not. The CDC has, has changed their guidance. I think a lot of, in North America at least, it's, uh, it's something that is uh, looked at as positive to start wearing masks when we're in public and so on. So that was that's a shift, right, over the last week or so from where we saw the position maybe a few, uh, a few weeks prior. Um, so let's get into some basics about HEPA filtration, right? The reason why we're using it is because, or we're looking at that as one of the solutions, is because of the fact that it stays relatively efficient all the way across the particle distribution that you see here on the x-axis. So 0 0.01 micron all the way up to 10 micron um, you know, you've got a very good efficiency range for the HEPA filter at 99.97. Now, there are filters that behave even better than that, right? At 99, 99.99, uh, 99.997, and then a couple more nines and so on. And we've seen these types of filters being used in uh, microchip assembly plants, for instance, right? Areas where you have to have extremely low particle count. Um, so this technology can still be used in healthcare. It just hasn't really been at, to that level, uh, or we haven't had to go to that level yet. Although we're seeing a lot of people think about it now. So one of the other, uh, uh, you know, one of the documents that has been issued as of late, which is Ashray's position, excuse me, Ashray's position document on infectious aerosols, um, and that's a document that was, uh, you know, it's just been released recently, right? We're talking April 14th. Uh, approved by the board of directors. It's kind of out in the public now over the last couple of days. For some of you who haven't seen it, there's a lot of interesting things on it in terms of uh, how do aerosolized or suspended droplet nuclei travel through space? How do they possibly um, form or, or, or get transmitted through resuspension? Um, what drops off in size? What stays airborne and so on? Really interesting document for those of you who haven't looked at it yet. Um, if you're worried about air cleaning in your facility, it's something to definitely uh, consider and, and to walk through kind of what ASHRAE's position is on this because it really addresses everything that's needed uh, to be looked at. So a couple of things that have come out, right, is ASHRAE's statement on airborne transmission of SARS-CoV-2 COVID-19. Um, and they talk about transmission of SARS-CoV-2 through the air is sufficiently likely that airborne exposure um, to the virus should be controlled. So changes to building operations, including operations of the ventilation and air conditioning system, can reduce airborne exposure. So that's important. And ASHRAE's position is to basically keep the systems running. No, no shut systems off. You know, we've had this kind of uh, discussion before in terms of um, shelter in place and exposure to chemical gases or weaponized gases when you're talking about sheltering in place in certain buildings. And they've always said, you know, what do we do? Do we turn the system off and not allow the contaminant to enter the space? Well, in this case, it's do you turn the system off and not allow the contaminant to propagate through the space necessarily? But the answer is to keep it going, make its way eventually through the filtration system, dilute the pollutant as much as you can, and maybe intervene by, um, you know, putting in a negative uh, pressure air machine in some of the infected areas. So the other statement that naturally is taken on here is ventilation filtration provided by heating and ventilation air conditioning systems can reduce airborne concentrations of SARS-CoV-2, if properly applied, of course. So these are the kind of things that ASHRAE is concerned about. And again, every hospital or every healthcare facility is different. It's just a question of being able to be smart about how we apply uh, the technology and the equipment we have. Now, let's keep in mind, it's a good point to mention that we're not necessarily 
uh, you know, this is the engineering community where I'm talking to a group of engineers. Well, I'm not a medical professional. Uh, I'm a professional engineer, but the, the, the approach that we're taking is how do we remove the contaminant? How do we filter to the, to the best of, of our abilities? Uh, we really can't do much about people that are in close proximity to each other or transfer, uh, you know, from somebody who coughs on somebody directly or somebody who shakes somebody's hand and then gets infected. But what we can do is create an environment that's as, as safe as it possibly can be by putting in the appropriate equipment and applying HVAC solutions in the appropriate way. So let's take a look at particle settling in, in still air. We look at the different size distributions. Again, this is a uh, diagram directly from uh, ASHRAE's position document that I, that I just spoke about. And you take a look at you know, some of the hours. So these suspended droplets can be resident for a significant amount of time. We're talking you know, a couple of days maybe even where you've got uh, that droplet nuclei either dried up to some degree and maybe waiting to be reactivated in the presence of high humidity uh, and it's floating through space. In other cases, it'll drop off and settle in relative seconds or even minutes onto surfaces, which is why you know the medical advice is always to clean surfaces and keep those surfaces clean because even if the infectious um, uh, you know the particle drops off and, and lands on the surface, it could still be uh, active and we don't want to obviously touch it and then touch our face and so on. So a lot of dynamics going on with the patient relative to the patient bed, relative to where they sit. A lot of science has been developed over the years. We were involved in projects like this when SARS-1 was initially identified in Southeast Asia, and then MERS, uh, or the Middle Eastern Respiratory uh, Disease, that was identified shortly thereafter. Um, and there was a lot of discussion about how patients react when they're on respirators, how their exhaust, basically from their body, makes its way to the healthcare worker and healthcare professional, where that professional should stand, where we should be pulling air in away from the patient's breathing zone as well as the healthcare worker's breathing zone. And you'll see some uh, discussions on that with ASHRAE where they say, you know, that the exhaust system should be at the head basically of the patient, you know, so you're pulling air away from the breathing zone of either the healthcare professional or the, or the, uh, the patient themselves. So a lot of air dynamics play, you know, they play a very significant role in how we apply any kind of HVAC strategy. So just remember that as we walk through that we need to understand how the air is moving through. You know, a lot of contaminated industrial facilities, we talk about push-pull ventilation to remove welding fumes or, you know, different types of gases that are developed through a, a manufacturing process. It's a very similar approach here, right? We're trying to keep an unknown, unseen, you know, sometimes, uh, you know, virus or infectious disease away from the breathing zone of the, uh, of the workers. Um, so ASHRAE talks a little bit about the last slide on that is, you know, we're appropriately selected um, filtration systems, either uh, ceiling mounted or portable or centralized systems can be very effective in controlling the transmission of the uh, airborne infectious disease. Um, so what is some of the guidance, right, on, on these negative pressure rooms? Because we're going to lead into uh, some of the products that we've recently developed uh, for this type of application. Um, airborne infectious isolation or AII rooms, there's a variety of different ones. This is directly from ASHRAE's publication a couple of weeks ago where they had uh, um, a PowerPoint that they issued to uh, some of the, um, the members of the of ASHRAE community, of which I'm one sitting on several committees. And, and um, as an ASHRAE distinguished lecturer, I spend a lot of time focusing on what ASHRAE standards really mean, right, in the, in the applied world. Um, so if you look at these kind of diagrams, it's kind of interesting because let's say option two, which is your classic way of applying a negative pressure HEPA machine, right? Small unit, 500 CFM, up to maybe 1,000 CFM of air in a particular room of about 375 to 400 square feet. These rooms are like the size of a typical hotel room, right? Everybody's been in a patient area especially if it's converted into an isolation room, you'll typically have a toilet, you'll have the patient bed area and a walking uh, area to, to enter. Uh, you'll notice the dotted lines on the entry door there into that room. And that's the suggested um, way of maybe isolating or creating negative space. Um, so we don't necessarily have uh, air being drawn in through the main room and we don't cross contaminate right into the corridor. Uh, look at the HEPA machine there with the HEPA filter. You, know, you basically knock out a window and put in plexiglass with a 10-inch round duct or an 8-inch round flex duct, and you create negative pressure in, in that room. Um, but all the air that is exhausted outside goes through the HEPA filter. So hopefully being able to capture most of it, 
before you discharge to the outside. Another interesting approach, and we've seen a lot of customers as of late, I'm talking within the last few weeks, utilize the machine that we have available or the unit that we have available using it as a full recirculation device. So option six is where you don't duct in or out, and all you do is simply use the unit in very high air changes in the space um, to reduce the steady state concentration of any airborne infectious disease in particular that uh, that could be generated in the space as well. So it's quite effective in that way. In a room of about 400 square feet, you could probably reduce it in about 30 minutes. We'll see a diagram on that in a second. So some of the other things to mention, and, and ASHRAE goes through this, right? And they say, hey, you know, be careful, right? As, as resident engineers or design engineers, let's all walk, make sure that we're careful about um, what happens to the rest of the HVAC system as we start deploying these negative air machines and converting rooms. Now, historically, hospitals have always kept a couple of these machines ready for a patient surge. Um, as we can see now, you know, this patient surge that we're seeing in many of the states across the country or, you know, is actually, or major, major cities is, is actually much more than we've ever anticipated, right? They're trying to, you know, flatten the curve so we don't get an overload in the, H, in the healthcare uh, environment. And um, a lot of the HVAC systems will be thrown off, right? The controls will need to be readjusted. We'll need to balance uh, the rooms off again and be able to make sure that we don't create an imbalance somewhere else with all that exhaust there and then conversely, the makeup air needed to come back into the space. Now, <clears throat> if we're looking at the Chicago market, you know, that's one thing, right? Moving forward, we're going into the summer months, and we're going to be looking at that. Uh, so we're going to require, uh, you know, ample cooling to offset this makeup air that's being brought in as a result of all this exhaust that we're generating now. Um, so that will need to be considered. So something to look at with regards to air handling systems is not only the rebalance, but the recontrol or the control systems and also maybe even resetting chilled water temperatures uh, with the chillers to make sure that we can actually handle the, uh, the added cooling load as a result of all this exhaust and then conversely all the makeup air. So it's just something to keep in mind, these negative pressure machines can throw off the entire system and it needs to be rebalanced and re-looked at. Some of the other things that ASHRAE said, again, directly from them, right, is the, the obvious things that we all know about. VAV systems, which are you know, typical in a lot of these areas, need to be addressed as well. Uh, a variable air volume system at its minimum, uh, you know, might not be enough, right, to be able to treat certain zones uh, of the of the area or of the building, um, you know, depending on where you've got your solar gains and what's going on throughout the day, your zones are going to change. And with that, you need to maybe reset your VAV system. So just something to watch. Another thing that needs to be watched is, you know, any of the other systems that are in play on the air side, right? And particularly the ones that are very vulnerable are energy recovery ventilators. Now, we don't see a lot of these in critical areas of healthcare, obviously, for obvious reasons, because they cross contaminate and so on. But there are definitely possibilities where an ERV might be present and might be exposed to a certain level of, uh, of contamination. One of the options that you saw in those sketches, right, um, that the HEPA machine could be ducted to the return air. If that's the case, and the return air starts seeing, and the exhaust side of the central station air handlers with a heat wheel start seeing some of that contaminated air, we might run into a problem, right? So you don't want the heat wheel to be exposed to that. Uh, there's obviously a lot of ways to do that. It's obviously stop it from functioning, to stop it from rotating, maybe, uh, you know, or bypassing it completely if it has a bypass function on it. So just something to, uh, to, to take a look at. Let's switch gears a little bit and look at Minnesota Department of Health, because I like the graphics for this document, and it really, uh, it was published before um, a lot of the recent stuff that ASHRAE has come out with, but um, it, it really gives us guidance in, in very much the same way as the ASHRAE guidelines. So they followed that, they followed CDC, and they followed, uh, you know, NIOSH in terms of the way that they approach certain things. So uh, you look in the center there, we talk about examples that they're giving their directives to uh, the, their, their resident engineers. Uh, ventilation, filtration, ultraviolet germicidal irradiance, or uh, UVGI, which we'll talk about. Um, of course, uh, air, airborne infectious isolation rooms, AIIRs, local exhaust, and ventilation devices. Take a look at the left-hand side of this diagram. This is interesting because we mentioned before about the air changes per hour required in these facilities, right? If you're, especially if you're using this system as a recirculation system. So in other words, it's not a negative pressure unit. It's simply wheeled into the room to reduce the steady state concentration of the airborne infectious disease 
if you look at 12 error changes right on the left and you go to the right hand side at 99.9% .9 efficiency, you need about 35 minutes to purge a room, right? Um, that, you know, a, a typical patient room, and I'm talking about a room between 375 to 400 square feet or, or so. So it gives you a bit of an idea that, you know, it doesn't take that long before a room can actually be purged and the steady state concentration can be reduced significantly. Now, of course, the source is the patient, right? So as the patient is exhaling and so on, there's there's continued, you know, what the medical community calls virus shedding and so on, and, and, and there's the water droplet nuclei that are being, you know, uh, released into the environment. So that needs to be looked at as well. We don't have a um, we don't have a stable uh, or steady source of contaminant that's actually ongoing, right? Um, so left unchecked, it'll it'll exponentially load into the room. So these are the ways that we would treat it. So again, from their document, very similar graphics to the ones we saw from ASHRAE. The top left being the classic way to put in a, a negative HEPA machine. The middle one on the right hand side to be the exhaust one into the return grill, which we don't see many many uh, of our applications using. There's a lot of obviously risk to doing it that way. We got to make sure that we remove everything, and it's not necessarily you know the the best way to do it, but in some cases we have no choice. And then um, take a look at the bottom left where you've got a plastic curtain that's been affixed, right, taped on the ceiling and on the bottom, and creating a negative pressure area around uh, the patient uh, themselves. There's also a, a larger scale version of this, right, which is like we've seen in um, uh, the Javits Center in New York, uh, I believe the McCormick Center in, in Chicago, I saw a news report on that, that it's been converted as well recently to be able to handle large surge capacity, right, or influx of patients. And hopefully it doesn't have to be used, but it's there on standby and they built up these, these temporary uh, rooms, right, for patients. So in those particular areas, these, these HEPA machines can be used and are often used either as pure recirculation systems to reduce steady state concentration. They're used to create negative pressure zones or neutral pressure zones. Uh, you know, and you can see them located in various areas and hallways here on the right hand side. Um, they can also be located on the entrance level. If you look at the left where, um, you know, healthcare professionals are walking into the patient areas um, and making sure that those rooms that they walk through are double door sealed and, and filtered right before they make their way in or out. Um, let's remind ourselves a little bit about HEPA filtration. Um, we want to talk, you know, there's a, there's a concern always when you put in systems uh, into, uh, you know, air handlers that you want to make sure the HEPA is well sealed. We're talking about viruses, right? So the size that we're dealing with, as we mentioned before, you know, 0 0.01 or 0 0.001, some very small uh, droplet nuclei, right, in particle size in micrometers or, or, or you know, micrometers, and then, um, or microns, and then we move all the way up, you know, to the visible range, right, beyond bacteria into human hair and pollen. So it gives you an idea, right? That's obviously why we can't see what's there. It's it's floating around in space, and it's obviously much smaller than the human eye can can see. So we talk about the virus size in this particular case, COVID. There's various literature out there that talks anywhere between 0 0.05 to 0 0.2 micron, right? Uh, another article I read was 0 0.12 micron, right, in terms of mean particle diameter for the COVID-19 virus in particular, right? Of course, that'll vary, right? There's particle dispersion in different size ranges. But keep in mind, the HEPA is at 0 0.1, uh, excuse me, 0 0.3 micron, right? So the, the immediate question is, well, if it's only efficient at 99.97 at 0 0.3 micron and above, how do we know we're going to be able to treat anything, right? So those are the kinds of questions that come up. Uh, obviously, something is better than nothing. The HEPA can still do good work for us um, in terms of being able to filter out. Uh, a lot of times this particulate, or rather particulate attaches itself or vice versa uh, as the air currents and as the, the water droplet nuclei, you know, kind of moves its way through the, the air currents. Um, so there are ways to get this on multiple path strategies. So you put a HEPA machine in a room and you recirculate it a lot. Um, you will be able to reduce the steady state concentration just by virtue of a double, triple, quadruple pass through the system or, or more, right, um, as we move through the air changes in the space. So um, one of the things that ASHRAE also mentioned, and it's good that they do because, you know, on some of the committees that I've sat on over the years, uh, we've had a lot of different technologies look at or be, be looked at, right? And some of those technologies are, are quite interesting. Um, they are 
uh, technologies that are actually, um, you know, out there poised to be able to remove virus, bacteria, gas contaminants, and so on. But what we need to mention here and need to sort of identify is that ASHRAE is really only looking at two different technologies. One is being particle filtration all the way up through to HEPA, right, with different MERV ratings as, as needed, as staged as you, as you require, and then UVGI, ultraviolet germicidal irradiance. If it's applied properly, if you have the right intensity, in other words, the right watt seconds per centimeter squared at 254 nanometers or somewhere in that range to make sure that's the, the kill range that you need and the appropriate kill dose. Now, viruses are not that difficult to kill with UVGI. Bacteria tend to be a little harder. They need more intensity. And of course, mold spores are really difficult. They need quite a few or, or very high microwatt seconds per centimeter squared, you know, maybe in the 30,000 range. So um, with UVGI, as long as it's properly applied, you can actually kill off some virus uh, in, the, uh, in the airstream as long as it actually makes its way to the machine, right, or to the air distribution system. So you need to look at this and just be aware that there's some other technologies that are making claims. And I think ASHRAE committees in particular, especially the, the recent committee that was appointed for this, this issue uh, in, in, in so far as the pandemic, uh, you know, they're having to fight off uh, this and, and actually make sure that companies, you know, really are careful about what they claim, right? And, you know, ASHRAE can only do what it can, but it can give us guidelines. So HEPA filtration, UVGI, those are the two strategies, and that's the technologies that we should be sort of focusing in on. There's other things that we could look at uh, insofar as um, antimicrobials, or what this one is, is something that Carrier uses in a lot of our airside machines, which is uh, silver ion, right, or AG ion. It's a, uh, an FDA certified antimicrobial, right? So that any living organism that settles onto its paint structure because of the uh, zeolite matrix that's incorporated in the paint, um, it'll, actually, uh, it'll actually kill uh, the virus and, and disturb its DNA to the degree that it can't reproduce. So the colony forming units, as we measure, and these organisms uh, don't get generated and you basically kill off uh, any kind of living organism. So it's a way to, you know, complement any of the systems that you have out there. Of course, you know, it's very difficult to apply in a, an existing in situ system, but in a new system, it can be incorporated right away. The other thing, the other two issues to, to look at when we're talking about control and on the HVAC side is, of course, mo moisture management, which ASHRAE standard 62.1 is always kind of, well, not always, but, you know, over the last 10 years or so, integrated a section in there uh, to talk about how we handle moisture, right, coming off cooling coils, positive drainage, humidification systems um, need to be, make sure that they're controlled properly and we don't, you know, increase the amount of humidity in a space unnecessarily and we don't have standing water in the air handling system, we don't promote legionilia and all these other things that can be or can contribute to a, a, a problem uh, in the space. The other, uh, the other thing that you see lately, and it's actually in ASHRAE's documents has been adopted as well, is there's a lot of studies out there about, you know, where the humidity needs to be. It turns out, it, it, you know, ideally in ASHRAE's comfort zone, right? For those of you who remember that psych chart with the temperature range, well, there's also the 40 to 60% relative humidity range that sits perfectly in our human comfort zone. And there's a reason for that, obviously, because bacteria, viruses, mold, allergens can thrive in very dry climates as they can in very humid climates, right? Intuitively, you think, well, the more humid it is, the potential you have of having problems beyond 60% RH. It's also the case on the dry side as well. Uh, and there's all kinds of evidence on the, um, on the healthcare side, what, what I, and I won't spend too much time on, but indicates that, uh, you know, if you have a dry nasal path passage and so on, it's not good because you, you could, um, you know, it would be difficult for you to fend off any kind of airborne infectious disease. So you're better off being in a humid environment that's controlled between 40 to 60%. So it's just something else to look at. So let's go through a couple of slides to give you some examples of what's been done in healthcare applications in kind of different areas. And then we'll talk about the negative pressure machine and finish off. So uh, airside systems, you know, hospitals are aware of, uh, you know, disposal of a lot of uh, materials, right? Obviously from um, you know, anything from cancer drugs uh, to, uh, you know, specialty areas in hospitals uh, where they have medical waste in general, right? Well, that could be the gowns, it could be masks and so on. So here's a custom air handler, if you will, with all kinds of filtration in it and high plume exhausters handling the medical waste part of the actual hospital. 
And somebody asked us about our negative pressure unit and how you can, how do you dispose of the filter? Well, typically it'll be handled the same way a lot of the other medical waste is handled within the hospital itself. Other ways to do this is with biocontainment. We see a lot of airside systems that we've provided over the years that, that uh, have a bag in bag out assembly, right? So we've got dish dampers that are, you know, shown here on the left at a high pressure, they're sealed up to 20 inches of water column and they can isolate the uh, HEPA filtration that's on the right hand side, those, those uh, case and, uh, case, uh, um, cases that are right there in the middle of 24 inch by 24 inch. And they basically are frames, right, that are coming off of a, uh, a compression seal and the bag actually envelops the filter for those of you who are not familiar with it so that the worker is not exposed to the virus that's contained in the system. So this is the extreme version of, uh, of biocontainment, um, which healthcare, often, you know, healthcare facilities often have, uh, all stainless steel, high grade 316 stainless wash down and so on. So the construction is there as well. The other thing that we need to look at, you know, is, is obviously custom air handling that has with it particle, gas, and biological filtration. So I talked about UVGI. There's your UV lamp on a cooling coil. Sometimes we require very high intensity of UV lamps, not just what you would typically require in a cooling type scenario where you just want to, you know, irradiate the coil and keep the coil clean. Um, in a lot of cases, you need the specific kill dose to address what you want to remove from the airstream. So that's something that we, you know, we, we help out with routinely to figure out how many lamps are you going to need per square foot and so on. Um, and then gas-based filtration for patients that are hypersensitive that can't even handle the contaminant load that we see in everyday outside air. Hospitals are in, you know, downtown cores. They have helicopter landing pads. A lot of that effluent can make its way into the outdoor air intakes. And a patient who already has breathing difficulties will have even more difficulty when sulfur oxides, hydrocarbons, nitric oxides, um, and all kinds of particle effluent come into the hospital itself. Here's just a, a view of a, a typical custom air handler with um, with bag in bag out assembly for isolation uh, areas in, in hospitals. Other types of hospital systems, right, require the mechanical side to be looked at, right? Redundancy, uh, fan arrays, redundant VFDs, making sure we have switchover capability. So if one VFD fails, the second one will kick on within seconds so that we can maintain airflow and pressurization or negative or positive in the particular rooms that we're serving. So that's an important aspect on the control side as well as on the mechanical side when looking at designing some of these systems. Uh, EMF frequencies, making sure we have line filters on the VFDs, making sure that they don't promote the problems with regards to uh, the electromagnetic frequencies in the space with all the healthcare equipment that's there to monitor. Sound is another issue, right? You wanna make sure that sound is, is maintained, uh, sound is low, uh, we don't have any casing radiated noise or any discharge or intake noise coming through the system. So a lot of times sound assessments go hand in hand and sound testing goes hand in hand even at the factory before we ship these systems out. So I just wanted to mention it there. An acoustic uh, review is always very important when we talk about these systems. This, um, this particular unit that I'm showing here, um, just to give you a little bit of an idea on, on software tools that are available. So we spent a lot of time with the design community um, putting together systems. This is from the National Institute of Health. We've got over uh, 30 odd systems that are there now. This is just one snapshot uh, at NIH in, in Washington, D.C. for some of their labs uh, that they're using. So this one's loaded also with very high-end filtration to provide uh, the filtration they require at, at the lab level. Um, <clears throat> another thing to look at is seismic uh, uh, requirements. Now, at Carrier, we're looking at not only for short term to be able to address COVID-19, of course, in this immediate pandemic, but also looking at what's going to happen a year from now, two years from now, three years from now, as hospitals realize they were possibly not necessarily as well planned as they could have been for this type of pandemic. Everybody's going to be rethinking what they're doing. We're already seeing plans put in place today for the next extension of a hospital and what it might need to look like in terms of providing systems that are redundant, that are resistive to seismic occurrence, that can provide the filtration and everything that we've, uh, we've just talked about. So uh, some of the other equipment, just before we look at the negative pressure machine uh, that is available, even our standard air handlers incorporate some form of UV light or can, will incorporate some level of HEPA filtration as needed. These are standard air handlers as well as custom. 
uh, AG ion, that uh, antimicrobial silver uh, ion lining that we talked about, um, that can all be integrated into our standard units as well as uh, our rooftop units. Um, this is just a, an idea of you know the rooftop units and what their kind of uh, uh, filtration availability is. Some of these units can be retrofitted to higher levels, some can't, right? We need to look at the fan system to make sure that it can actually handle um, whatever that filtration requirement is. It's not always capable, but we can put in as much as possible, right? Most hospitals are now by code start with a MERV-8, which we can provide, and then of course, go into a HEPA filter, possibly at the air handler level before it gets uh, sent in or distributed throughout the building. So let's finish off with the uh, negative air pressure machine. Carrier calls this the OptiClean. Um, we've set up a, a, you know, to repurpose a production line uh, at one of our uh, six facilities uh, in Monterey, Mexico, to manufacture uh, what used to be uh, furnace uh, casings or basically a furnace unit. <clears throat> we've repurposed it to be able to address the um, the requirement for these negative pressure uh, machines. So we launched it. Uh, just a couple of days ago, this has been ongoing over the last few weeks. It's UL certified. It provides the HEPA filter at 99.97 percent at 0.3 micron. It can provide a MERV 7 or a MERV 8 pre-filter as well, um, and will provide 500 cfm or slightly above, actually, to the space. Um, and it can be wheeled in. It's on casters. It's plugged into a 115 volt outlet. It's UL listed. Uh, the dimensions are on the bottom there. We see the cabinet dimensions of uh, 17 inches wide or so by 22 by uh, 49 uh, inches high. Um, it's, you know, standard carrier warranty and so on. And with that comes, you know, uh, TEC's expertise in terms of how to apply it. As I mentioned before, there are six different ways uh, that ASHRAE proposes. There's a lot of creative ways that people are using these machines right now, depending on the healthcare application. So, you know, reach out to anybody so we can discuss it and we can sort of give you an idea of where and how these units can be applied. <clears throat> the unit itself has a UV, uh, sorry, has a filter indicator light on it, right? So the operator doesn't have to worry too much. Um, there are many hours of operation for this HEPA filter, right? They won't load up uh, and need to be changed out for at least a, you know a year, maybe even longer, um, depending on the on the usage of of this machine. The water, air basically comes in from the bottom and then uh, discharges at the top. These units have been tested, right, to make sure that they meet. Uh, the particle count uh, distribution on the intake and on the discharge side. So the HEPA is, is very well sealed um, and um, make sure that there's no bypass. So you can look at the graph on the left-hand side. We start off slightly higher, right, about 600 uh, CFM out of this unit. And as the filters load up over time, right, you're going to sort of reduce down to close to 500 uh, or just a bit above 500 CFM. So it's always giving you a little bit more than you would nominally need for those particular rooms to make sure we maintain pressurization. There's another version of that, uh, this unit that's coming through now with all kinds of different features. We've had a lot of indications that it'd be nice to have variable speed on the unit to be able to balance possibly uh, in this space. So uh, I just wanted to show you something about University of Rochester. We have a couple of these units that have already been deployed and um, we've been getting comments right from different uh, different directors of the facilities. And this is one that I thought was interesting because it actually indicates that, you know, they were very happy with the system as it was applied uh, in their space, um, looking at possibly putting in uh, more um, as the need arises. And uh, they talk about the OptiClean and uh, the solutions from Carrier are necessary to effectively remove contaminants uh, from the negative pressure within the patient uh, patient area. So a lot of different ways to apply it. Uh, like I said, it's just up to us to sort of help guide as to how it'll be. Just to give you a bit of an idea, for those on the call who are not, you know, uh, part of TEC or part of Carrier, but are consultants, we know we this is a rapid launch, right, over the last three weeks to uh, repurpose and convert um, an existing uh, unit to be able to provide the HEPA filtration that it has. Um, you know, we needed a mobile unit and something that could be wheeled around so that basically had to go through testing very, very quickly, um, and we were able to do it. So they are now, <clears throat> TEC is now ready to take orders on this product. It's now in manufacturing as we speak uh, at our, uh, at that pro dedicated production line in, uh, in, um, in Monterey, Mexico. <clears throat> so uh, with that, I just wanted to sort of give an overview and talk a little bit about how it was done. If there are any questions, um, we, uh, I'm free to uh, answer anything. Ryan, if, uh, if anything comes up, let me know. Yep, we do have a few questions here. 
Uh, so Ernest asks, are the slides going to be made available? Uh, the slides can be made available. Uh, there's certain certain aspects of the slides that uh, just, we just have to get clearance on, but I think TEC could make these available. Yes. Okay, I'll have you send me whatever we're allowed to share, and then I can share it with uh, those who need it. Um, Nate you guys, asks, yes, we'll do that. Okay. Nate asks uh, about the sound of the unit, about the uh, the portable unit. How loud is it? Oh, yeah. So, so good question. So, uh, remember, I was I would mentioned earlier about the variable speed uh, requirement, and some uh, some of the requests have come in around that, and that that centers a little bit on pressure balance, but also on sound. Right, if you want to run it a little lower while the patient's sleeping or something like that. So, right now, I'm <laughs> I'm actually waiting for uh, the official sound testing uh, to come through, and it should be here. Uh, I should be able to get something today. But essentially, um, we're shooting for the 60 dBA range, something like that. Um, I don't believe it's gonna be higher than that. Uh, and I think most of uh, other devices that are similar on the market have been between 56 to, to 60 dBA, depending on the CFM capability. So this one goes up to 600 CFM, so it could range a little higher, and then you can, you can bring it down. So I should have that, that information actually very soon. And I think, Ryan, maybe you could, uh, disseminate that once we get available to you uh, within the next day or so absolutely we have everybody's uh contact email that's on today so we can share whatever we need to share uh muhammad asked a question it seems pretty broad uh but he asks is hepa the most effective against covid well yeah that that is a broad a broad question so maybe just to recap ash race position and, and carrier's position is that um, HEPA filtration, now there are various levels of HEPA efficiency, right? But let's keep in mind, just to use the term loosely, as HEPA filtration or particle filtration in general, as well as UVGI, are really the two technologies that we want to be able to rely on to effectively control as much as possible the propagation of, of, of COVID uh, as an airborne infectious disease. Not only COVID, but anything else, right? Uh, these technologies have been used in tuberculosis wards, for instance, which is also another airborne infectious disease. Uh, SARS, MERS, this is the technology of, of choice, right? So with the, your question, if I was to read into it a little bit more, there are HEPAs that are higher than, uh, you know, 99.97 at 0.3 micron. So there are more efficient ones that go to 99.999, three nines, four nines, and so on and you can get all the way to what's labeled sometimes as an ALPA filter, right? Ultra low particle arrestance. So um, I think that for the application, for the pressure differential, for cost effectiveness, the, 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 the industry is pretty much settled on a HEPA at 99.97 at 0.3 micron. We've seen some at 99.95, right? They label it that way, just slightly less than the 97 that we have in, in our machine. Um, but I think at the end of the day, What's important is how it's applied, and if we can get the airborne virus or infectious disease to the unit, uh, that is more important than sometimes just having an extra level of slight filtration. So I don't know if that answers your question, but also we also need to consider sealing integrity and make sure that the HEPA itself, not only is it rated, but the casing that it sits in and the framing that it sits in is also rated as well. And Carrier took a lot of time to make sure that that was done properly so that you know, we didn't have air leakage or bypass uh, around the filter housing itself. All right, uh, Nate had a follow-up comment to the loud uh, sound question, uh, saying that what they use in the patient rooms currently is much louder than what you were talking about with the 60 dBA. So this would be pretty pretty useful in that regard. Um, Matt asks. Yeah, uh, it, it, sorry. Go ahead. I was going to say it's it, it's a good point because it's important to note that. You know, there's a lot of equipment in these patient areas, right? A lot of stuff going on, uh, uh, medical devices is what I'm referring to as well, uh, as even, even just general air conditioning that's there. So, um, you know, having a unit in that range of the 60 dBA, I believe is, uh, or we believe is, uh, is, is going to be reasonable, right? Especially if it comes with the next generation, which has speed control. Um, Matt asks, are there any concerns with ECM motors interfering with in-room medical equipment? 
so good question because the the negative uh, air pressure machine the OptiClean has an ECM motor uh, built in um, it, uh, it th we've had that question before I just had it actually two days ago uh, last Friday and um, the answer is that there I think there's always a concern with uh, with ECM just to make sure that it doesn't affect it but we don't believe that there's going to be uh, an issue we've got it uh, deployed now in I think four hospitals uh, or even maybe five at this point, and um, nobody's indicated any any issues related to the uh, EMF uh, interference uh, of any type. So yes, it's always a concern, but I don't believe it uh, if it's an issue with this uh, this unit at this point. All right, um, Muhammad asks, uh, can we use electrostatic perspirators in hospital applications? Maybe it means perspirators. I'm not sure what he's asking. That's uh, it means uh, uh, precipitators, electrostatic precipitator. So, various kinds, right, of electrostatic filtration that exist, right? There's there's electrical charge filters, right, who have a what they call ASHRAE labels as a uh, a synthetic MERV rating, right, where uh, not a mechanical MERV rating, but a synthetic MERV rating, whereby the filter has an artificial charge to it. That could either be at the factory or it could be continuous charge on the filter. And then there are others that are just to expand on your question that actually charge an electric field, right, um, to enhance the filter itself <clears throat> beforehand so that the particles actually get attracted to it better and give you a better MERV rating at a lower pressure drop, lower delta P. And then there is a precipitator, the way I understand that technology, you know, the term of precipitator is usually technology where we have collection plates and we have particles that are charged and then they get collected on a neutral plate uh, or a series of plates that are in the airstream so that we remove them from the system. So the answer is that um, we've got to be very careful with these electronic filtration technologies. Uh, so I would say that, um, you know, that's not necessarily something that we want to do. If, they, if they're not maintained properly, a lot of times they become ineffective. Uh, charged particulate ends up sometimes attaching itself to negative um, uh, surfaces in the space. So you end up seeing black areas around the diffusers or on the wall. Um, we've walked into a lot of systems where they forgot to maintain them altogether. Um, so anything that requires an electrical enhancement is something to, to just be careful about. I won't say that it's not effective, but um, it's not something that uh, is relying on just a, a static, in, you know, not, not static, I shouldn't say static, but just impingement method, right, which are, a HEPA filter is relying on. It just sits there and removes stuff without having to have a charge. So just, I would say be careful. I won't say that you shouldn't use it, just be careful about how it's applied and maintained. Thank you. Uh, Doug asks, how often does the HEPA filter have to be replaced? So good question. We had a lot of a lot of discussion about that, right? Um, in normal applications, we see HEPAs if they're protected properly with the right MERV filters before them, um, then they, you know, they, if they're running 24/7, they could last a year before they need to be changed. Some hospitals have them on a PM program, and every six to eight months they change them out regardless. In other cases, it's a year. We think on this particular unit, it's probably going to last a lot longer than a year. It might be up to about two years. Um, it really just depends, you know, on what's going on. But I would say that um, our recommendation has always been, let's say it's being used during this pandemic. Um, once it's over and once the unit no longer is required for that room, that it be uh, decontaminated and reconditioned with a brand new filter and ready to de and wrapped up and then ready to deploy, hope, you know, for the next event if there is ever one to occur. That's our recommendation. Um, Mohammed asks, can reducing the velocity of air on the cooling coil where ASHRAE recommends to 500 feet per minute, can we stop the viruses passing through? Uh, I'm assuming you must be, um, if, you, if you slow the air down, will the UV light be more effective or something? I didn't mention UV light, but I can't imagine why else it would matter with the cooling coil. Yeah. Yeah, it is. so the cooling coil, you know, obviously is not doing anything from a filtration standpoint. Um, reducing the air across the coil can do two things, right? Um, it is a matter of practice when we design our air handling systems. We don't want any carryover moisture because that can lead to its own problems with regards to mold or 
bacteriological growth. The other thing is we, if you do have UV lamps, I assume that's what the question means, then you could have better contact time. So with UV, just like with filters, velocity is important because the slower the velocity, the more contact time, the more exposure the contaminant has to the light, the more probability you'll have of capturing it or killing it on the first pass or disturbing its DNA, which is really what you're trying to do. But generally speaking, the cooling coil would need to be, we wouldn't just have normal UV light there. We would have to have very high intensity UV light, many, many lamps there to be able to provide an ample level of kill uh, capability. Uh, so it's possible. It's just, it, it's not conventional. It's not like we, we normally see where you have one or two lamps across the surface of the coil. You need to have much more intensity usually if you're trying to use it as a viral control. Yeah, it would be it would be pretty tough. Even if you lowered yourself from 550 to 450 feet per minute, a normal bulb bulb still isn't going to do much for moving air going through. Um, right, and you can't lower it too much to the point where you frost up the coil. So there's all kinds of issues with that if you go too low, right? So yeah, we usually recommend that UV bulbs are best for cleaning the stationary things like the coil and the drain pan, and they do pretty minimal for the air. Um, doesn't hurt, but like you said, the contact time is so, is so long compared to the intensity of the ball. It's it's tough to do just that. Uh, Mohammed has yes. a few more questions Correct. here. Um, he asks, does using a high MERV rating filter make any difference? Um, wait, make any difference like using an optimal MERV rating filter, like a MERV 16? I'm guessing he's, he's asking, I'm assuming he's asking, does a, does a HEPA filter do better than a MERV 16? I'm guessing what he's asking. Well, yeah, I think for sure it does because the HEPA is rated higher, right? Well, uh, you know, MERV 16 and then the, the different, there's different, um, different labeling now, right? We used to go to MERV 20 and, um, and, and now they're looking at HEPAs as, you know, they start off at, HEPA starts off at 99.97% efficiency at 0.3 micron and above. That's your first level HEPA. After that, you can go to more nines, right? And you can get into more, uh, more higher efficiencies. If you're gonna if you're gonna stop at a MERV 15, a MERV 16, or so on, it's still gonna give you uh, some efficiency. Like you might be at 90, 90 to 95 percent effectiveness at 0.3 micron or above, and and that's that's still some value to you. Particularly if you're going through a multiple pass strategy where you're recirculating a lot and you're going to be capturing the particles and having a chance to agglomerate possibly in the space and then we get recaptured, attach itself to a particle, and then there's a lot of dynamics going on, right? And then it eventually gets impinged and it gets caught. Um, so the beauty about a HEPA, 99.97, 0.3, is that usually it does very well on the first pass. And that's sometimes you don't always have multiple pass available, right? You're just getting the air to come through one time uh, before it gets reintroduced through the uh, through the main branch ductwork. So. So uh, I, I think if I, hopefully I answered your question, but anything is better than nothing. And if you can only step up to a MERV 16, well then that, that in itself will, you know, will help. It'll help. It's not perfect, but it'll help. Yeah, I think we put, if you put HEPA on the MERV scale, it'd be like a, a low end HEPA, probably like a MERV 18 or 19, I'm guessing, uh, based on that 0.3 micron range. I think 17. 17 yeah, 17 okay. would be the, the first level, I think, yeah. And then when you get to the ALPA, you're, that's when you're at the MERV 20 type range. Correct. And that's like in laminar flow rooms, microchip assembly plants, certain labs, certain pharmacy, uh, pharmaceutical activities where you need extremely low particle count. We're talking like less than a, a class 10 clean room, which is 10 particles per cubic foot of air, right? Um, so we're talking about really, really low particulate count. Just so everybody, you know, realizes you know a typical particle count in any given room could be 400,000 to 500,000 particles per cubic foot right whereas um you know a class 10,000 clean room a class 10 clean room which everybody's heard about class 1 clean room that's when you get down to extremely low particle counts and the only way to do it is through laminar flow rooms with with huge amount of recirculation so that you get the room uh attenuated or reduced to an extremely low steady state concentration so it's all achievable. It's just that technology is not typically applied in healthcare because it's expensive. So it's there 
as HVAC professionals, we know we have the methodology. Uh, we do it in industry. We just don't apply it to healthcare, unfortunately. Does anybody else have any other questions we want to uh, ask Brian while we have him on the line here? I'll give you guys another minute if you want to ask anything else. I think I got all of them. I'm scanning back through. I think I got them all asked. Well, Ryan, if anything else comes up, obviously, you know, you, they can always send you questions and we can always try and answer, you know, over the next few days if, uh, if other questions have developed. Yeah, no, absolutely. We'll definitely do that. Um, if anybody does have any questions, um, you can just send me an email. It's uh, Ryan, R-Y-A-N dot Hoger, H-O-G-E-R at T-E-C Mungo dot com or reply to any of the five million reminder emails you probably got for this event. Uh, and I'll get you the right answer. I'll get you the answer that has the right answer, one or the other. All right, Brian, we thank you very much for your time. Thanks for joining us. And uh, hopefully we have you back again soon. Thank you. Nice meeting everybody. I appreciate it. Thank you.